Hello, everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every Wednesday, photographers meet here to connect, inspire, and create. Our guest speakers share their images, tips, and techniques, and a little bit of inspiration to help you improve your own photography. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions on YouTube. Tonight's guest is Sandy Zelasco. Sandy is a freelance nature photographer specializing in North American wildlife, and Sandy's work promotes ethical practices in the field of conservation photography. She actively donates her talents towards land acquisition for better connectivity and wildlife sustainability. Sandy's photography is international awarded and most recently published in Nature's Best magazine, Wyoming Wildlife Magazine, and Wild Planet Photo Magazine. And in tonight's presentation, the Salton Sea Project, Sandy's going to discuss this invaluable habitat for an entire desert ecosystem comprised of fish, birds, reptiles, mammals, amphibians, invertebrates, aquatic and desert plants, and humans. It's at its breaking point. It's located in the Imperial Valley of Southern California. Its extreme challenges and complex restoration ideas lie ahead in order to save the sea. Her presentation will include a discussion on whether we can rescue the Salton Sea and the importance of conservation photography. If you're on Instagram, look for her at SLZ Photo, and please visit her website at investinnature.org to see a list of her upcoming photography workshops. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Sandy. Thank you, Linda. It's nice to be here. <laughs> long I'm, time coming. <laughs> it, it has been a long time coming, and I have to apologize for that because I I get so excited about like filling in the slots, then I don't realize like, hey, some of these people are on the on the list for like six months out. Some are a little bit longer, and then you know it's kind of I, I have had to be, uh, some of the guests say, "Gee, I wonder if she's going to be doing this in seven months." And sure enough, I circle back, and here we go. So. Um, we were trying to figure out how I ran across you and I really do not know. Um, so I, I know that it has to do with conservation photography and that's something that I don't know a lot of, but I'm very interested in. And somewhere along the line, I might, I must've done a search and, and you fell into that little fishnet. So, um, and I, like with most of my speakers, I reach out and say, hey, I'm Linda, and this is what I do. And don't you want to come do this? And it always surprises me when people say yes. And, you know, and here you are. So thank you for doing this. Um, I really did just kind of skim over. You had a huge bio. Um, is there something that I missed that you would want to, you know, you want to share with us and, and maybe give people a little bit more of your background before you get started? Well, I do. Um... I do do a lot of uh, conservation, uh, you know, related things. I work with the National Bighorn Sheep Center in Dubois, Wyoming, and we run a photographer's retreat there every year in August, which is absolutely fantastic. And all the all the monies go to the National Bighorn Sheep Center, um, except when we pay our models or things like that, that we have to, you know, food, it's all inclusive. It's a great little program. Um, so, uh, I always encourage people to look at that because we have something new coming up every year. Uh, I lead workshops for Arizona Highway Photoscapes. Uh, that's what I'm doing in Utah right now, getting ready to lead one starting uh, on the 26th. Uh, fall color here. And, um, and then I do several other smaller things around. Uh, those are the big things I do. I do a few of my own workshops. And, uh, but I do like to keep in touch with, um, like some of the nonprofits that are in my area, in my backyard, including things at the Salton Sea happening there. I do a lot of research there. And um, yeah, we just got to keep this open land and space for our wild animals. And that's what I advocate for. 
Well, I appreciate that. Uh, so, I, and I think the answer is yes, but is this your, are you, this is full time for you, right? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, if you don't have anything else you want to add, feel free to start your presentation because sure. um, I knew that, um, yeah. Uh, we talked about this that you know you you actually have like a you do an hour and a half presentation and you've kind of like condensed it down for us but I don't want you to run out of time so let's go ahead and get started yeah so I'm going to try to um I first did this presentation for NAMPA North American Nature Photographers Association at their summit a couple of years ago before COVID and um so um I, since then I've whittled it down to about an hour uh you know so I could do it for other camera clubs and other um places around. So this is actually a story, a little bit of history, a little bit of, um, um, you know, a little bit of bird photography, a, a little bit of everything mixed into this. Uh, and it, it's kind of a fascinating area that I've uh, kind of fallen in love with. It's about three hours from my home in San Diego. Uh, so I go out there um, four or five times a year to see what's going on. Anyway, I call it the Salt and Sea Story History and Hope. And mm -hmm. so um, um, I'm hoping that we can save the Salt and Sea in some form or another. And I'm guessing that nobody been there if anybody's been there shout out yeah but I, I, yeah I had to admit that I didn't even know where it I, was when you mentioned it so I had to go look it up I've been there okay. okay Donna when were you there last um I was there probably about that was probably in um January of 2019 mm. oh good that was a good time still it's it's I've been photographing there 30 years this is one of the images um there um and I've I've acquired a lot of uh, information from either residents in town um I've taken tours with uh Dr. Tim Bradley who's a Dead Sea scientist um uh you know fishing game uh, any any of the wildlife guys out there I kind of try to hook on to every once in a while and then I read a lot about it so um uh 30 years I've been photographing out there um you know, from time to time. And more recently, lately, I'm, I make pretty often trips out there. This happens to be a dead pelican, and I don't want to see this again. This was just a really sad um, situation. But I'm going to just talk about kind of the ecological perspective, a little bit of the, about the conservation issues, and then maybe as some of the um, uh, things that can be done to help the sea and um, follow up with some bird photography. Uh, this happens to be a bunch of uh, uh, sand hills that are still, uh, you can still see them out there if you're there at the right time of year, which was January-ish, end of December, beginning of January is the best time to visit out there if you're out there for bird photography. So I'm going to dive into a little bit of history. This is actually a map of where the Salton Sink or the Salton Trough lies. And that you see is ancient Lake Kawea. I want you to notice those boundaries. I want you to see the current Salton Sea boundary within that. The ancient Lake Kawea is about six times larger than our current Salton Sea. And then I'm gonna tell you all about how it happened, how this, this whole landscape happened. Notice the Colorado River down in the right-hand corner uh, comes up from and through Yuma. And we're kind of, um, the ancient sea is across the uh, United States border with Mexico. Uh, a lot of that water came up from um, the Sea of Cortez. So keep those things in mind. It's surrounded by the Chocolate Mountains on the east, the Santa Rosas and the Velocitas Mountains on the west. Um, it is the ancient lake used to be about 100 miles long, 35 miles wide and 300 feet deep. It is nowhere near that now. Uh, you'll see the red line I just popped up there. That is the San Andreas Fault. It currently ends right about at Bombay Beach. It's one of the places to go photograph at the Salton Sea. Um, and we'll go through some of those places in a little bit. But um, but this, this is um, another little map that kind of shows you that it is this whole salt and sink that's surrounded by the yellow line is pretty much within the Colorado Desert District. So that gives you a little bit more uh, information to where this water comes from. Um, you can see down at the bottom the Gulf of California, and you can also see where Yuma is. Um, 
over here on the, the right side near, next to basin and range. Uh, I want you to just kind of get a, a better perspective of where this is, um, you know, where, we are, where we're at, where we're talking about. And then the Colorado River is up here in the right-hand corner. Um, it kind of flows down into Yuma and then flows, it, it typically, depending on in the past on weather uh, events and things like that, it would flow either um, in north into the Salton Sink or down south into the Gulf of California. Um, and then the Gulf of California uh, has a couple of rivers that come up and they flow north into the United States and into the Salton Sea as we know it now. And here's a little uh, uh, map of that area, another type of map, maybe help you see. Uh, up on the top, you can't see all of it, but it's where Palm Springs and Coachella Valley and all those things are up in the top part of the uh, Salton Sea. But down below, you see that there's uh, Brawley, El Centro, Imperial Valley, and that's where we grow a lot of crops and everything. So the Salton Sea is actually a terminal sea. It gets its water from the Whitewater River from the top left. Those are the San Bernardino Mountains. So that's a really nice, fresh source of river um, uh, water. So it's a beautiful, beautiful area to, to get water from. It also gets water from Mexico. I just mentioned uh, along the Alamo River from coming north and the New River. Um, and those two, unfortunately, are very polluted rivers. Um they, the, the, um, we're, uh, we're under sea level by 227 feet in the salt and sink. So you can just imagine everything. It's kind of like Death Valley, right? Uh, bad water at Death Valley. Uh, that's the first, uh, the lowest place on, in the United States. And this is the second lowest place. But the water that comes from Mexico is really dirty and polluted. So, um, right now that's an issue. Um, so that is uh, U.S. and Mexico are in negotiations to try to clean that water up. And there's some, um, yeah, I don't want to talk about that anymore because I'm a little disappointed it hasn't been done already. So I'll just say also that red line at the bottom is representative of the All-American Canal, which today takes water from the Colorado River and moves it across just above in, in the United States, just above the, the border. And it supplies all the irrigation water for the Imperial Valley, which you see in that lower area uh, right there underneath the Salton Sea. Um, it's all gravity felt fed water. So it's really cheap to acquire this water. Um, but it's not always there. The water is getting scarce. Uh, as you know, you probably read in the news all about that. <clears throat> so here's another map. This is a NASA map that shows the um, the gr the growth, the um, you know the the um, um, ag agricultural uh, business that, that that's out there at the lower part of the Salton Sea. It's also there's some agricultural uh, uh, stuff that uses the water uh, to the north of that in Coachella Valley, like date farming and things like that, grapes, uh, but. But other than that, um, it's just a big uh, sink of a really great soil uh, that came from deposited from the Colorado River. So, you know, when it made its journey there. Now, the river itself, the Colorado River itself, the Imperial Irrigation District or Imperial Valley, the people that that have are in charge of the water there have the first what rights to that water. And if you know anything about water rights across the United States, it, you know, you get there first, you get the first water rights. Ir Imperial Valley was the first place to actually use Colorado River water for irrigation. Seems kind of odd because it goes through a bunch of states, right? Um, but we were, well, not we, I don't live in Imperial Valley, I live in San Diego, but they have, um, Imperial Irrigation District is very, uh, stingy with their water. So, um, and rightfully so, I guess, if you had owned water rights, you would be too. Um, uh, to make note, it's uh, where you see that big blue dot. That is a, that is the Salton Sea area. And that is a, a major stopover site for migrating birds. And at some point um, there were over 500 species of migrating birds that come through the Pacific flyway and end up going even down into Argentina and below. 
And so, um, so it's a very, very important site uh, because we've wiped out a lot of other sites in, in the Central Valley. Uh, Tule Lake is gone. Mono Lake is compromised and things like that. So um, if birds are coming down the Pacific Flyway, it's really important for them to have that uh, stopover. Uh, now, if you want to visit there and you want to stay there for a little while, um, there's great little places to visit. I'm going to name those now. The first one is in the top portion. You'll see those little yellow boxes. That is the Salton Sea State Recreation Area. It's about 14 miles of beaches. And um, uh, they're not pristine beaches, but they are, they're nice beaches. And there is a camp, there's five campgrounds and one of them does have hookups. So that is uh, something you might want to know. There's a visitor center there. Um, then we have uh, what everybody, most everybody hears about is the Sunny Bono Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge. It's one of our, you know, five, 600 refuges around the United States. So it is very prominent. It's broken up into two units. Unit one down in the very bottom tip. And unit one is also part of, you see that yellow in the bottom portion of the Salton Sea. That's all still underwater, but that's all part of unit one. Uh, and unit two is a smaller portion. Unit one's about, uh, oh, I think it's about 17,000 acres. Unit two is only about 4,000 acres. And they're doing some improvements to unit one right now. They're adding 4,000 acres of wetland. Now that's going to be interesting to watch if you're coming to the area, because I don't know if they're going to give photographers or people foot access, driving access. I don't know what's going to happen down there yet, but it's uh, due to be finalized um, next year in 2023. So the north unit, I mean, the unit one gets fed by the new river. Unit uh, two is the terminus of the Alamo River. So both of those dirty rivers that are coming up from uh, Mexico are dumping into the Salton Sea. So you have now, remember, I'm going to remind you a little bit because this gets confusing, but you've got the Whitewater River coming in from the northern tip from the Santa uh, uh the anyway the mountains up there San Bernardino Mountains and you've got um, the New River and the Alamo River coming in from the bottom it's a terminal sea you also have a little bit of uh, runoff from farmers lands then there's the Worcester unit and all of these units are really uh, managed for the birds number one Number two, for hunting. Um, National Wildlife Refuges allow hunting on them. And whether I whether I think we're third in line, I don't think they really care whether they have photographers or not. But it's been a really successful place for photographing birds. So if you like that kind of thing, you might want to go there. Now, we go back in time even further quickly just to mention how we got to where we are today. So prior to 1540, there's no written records that there was any water in the Salton Sea in ancient Lake Kawea at all. So that's prior to 1540. Um, when there was water there, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, prior to 1540, there was water there. And the uh, Kawea Indians used to farm their fish uh, traps along the water. So if you looked at this image, you could see those palm trees. So I could bet you um, a million bucks that water was this high in the Salton Sea uh, prior to 1540. You can also see the fish traps. You can you can visit the thermal. Um, it's the little town of Thermal and the fish archaeology uh, site. Um, if you go through one of the museums there in Coachella Valley, you can see those little fish traps along there. They used to move those traps up and down um, as the water receded and grew. So it's kind of a fun little uh, hike to do out there and kind of a little bit, you know, of history mixed in there. So, um, again, since 1540 to about 1905, there was absolutely no water in that trough, except for the little stuff that was trickling in from the Whitewater River and some of the, um, uh, the Alamo and the New River from Mexico. There was really no water in that trough. It was bone dry. And we have reports of that um, from many sources. So 
the current Salton Sea, I just put up there in blue, and, and you can see that. That's from 1905 to present. So just keep that in mind. And where I have that little X mark that just ran across the screen is where the you can stand today and see the high water mark across um across the little um well, actually there's a highway there 86 and so if you're right there standing on that x mark you can actually see that high water mark still to this day pretty interesting so 1840s we started having what happened in the 1840s if you think back in history um gold rush started in california and so there were more than 8000 immigrants that started coming across that whole ancient Lake Kauia area and started realizing how fertile the soils were and thought they could bring water into the valley. So they started these irrigation ditches uh, and bringing it from the Colorado River over into the um, ancient Lake Kauia area. And remember, it's dry now. We're still in a dry, dry spell. So this Oliver Wozenkopf and the Southern Pacific Railroad team up, they start what they call um, the Imperial Canal. And, um, and, it, and he gets pretty far until he passes on. And so, um, it, but anyhow, in the middle of, the, of all this happening, uh, the salt, Liverpool Salt Works would go out and mine salt in the area. And, um, and then we had uh, uh, lots of citrus being um, grown in the area, along with alfalfa and um, uh, pineapple and all sorts of things like that in this area. So 1901, this George Chappie you see on the right-hand side, he picks up this idea of fertile ground in the Imperial Valley, and they he decides he's going to bring in the Imperial Canal and finish it off. And so that's what happens in 1901. So, so there's still no water in the Salton Sink. There's still no Salton Sea. There's still no Lake Kauia. It's all, it's all, we're going through a dry spell during this time. And 1901, they're bringing this water over by hand, you know, built canal system. So 1905 rolls around. You can see in that circle to the right, um, that Colorado River comes down into Yuma there. There's a levee block on one of the canals that there's bringing, uh, the Imperial Canal that's bringing that water across to the west and then feeding it up in Remember, it's gravity fed and it's going north at this point. And so uh, there's a there's a block in the canal and they decide, well, we've got to do something about that or, you know, all these people are going to lose their crops. So what happens? They make a um, they they make a um, cut in the levee and lo and behold, at the same time, the Colorado River changes its course and starts to flow west and north into the Salton Sink because of a weather condition, a big weather storm came through that year, which was, which nobody could foresee, right? And then, um, and at the same time, this river starts flowing. It's like a mile wide. It starts flowing into the Salton Trough for 18 months, okay? 18 months. At that time, there were over 10,000 settlers in the area, you can see buildings here um, that are just devastated. The Liverpool Salt Works went out of business. It was a horrible time. 120,000 acres were under cultivation. Southern Pacific lost their rail line. And so it was just a mess, a, just a mess. And it was a man-made mess, okay? So right off the top, we know to this day, we'll never, ever have as much water as we need to fill that Salton Sea again, because the Colorado River is so over allocated, right? So at this point, we've got this, this Salton Sea now, this lake bed that we call the Salton Sea, which is not as big as Lake Kauia, thank goodness, I guess. Um, but We've got now the Southern Pacific dropping um, dirt and rock and all that kind of stuff in the area. And February 8th, 1907, they finally stopped that flow of the Colorado River coming into the Salton Sink and rerouted it and stopped it. And it went back out into the Gulf of California. So, um, you know, it's it's a it's a 
issue. It's a, it's a body of water that we created accidentally. You got to know that. So that's kind of the history about the Salton Sea and how it, it got there. And so now 1906 rolls around and we've got um, some people some people's attention, especially birders in the area. Some some of the, like uh, Joseph Grinnell, um, you've probably all heard of him, seen books he's written and stuff. So 1906, they start paying attention to what actually is happening there. And all these um, birds on the Pacific Flyway are stopping over. And it's a great home for them now. What They lost all that um, you know, they hadn't had this water for 400 years, and now they've got water again in this area. And if you want to read more about it, I highly recommend The Wonders of the Colorado Desert. This was written by George Wharton James, and he was actually there when this was all happening. And he has first account, uh, account uh, you know, stories from the area when this was happening. So then Grinnell comes in, uh, you know, starts adding on to those stories. Uh, fish and wildlife decide they're going to make uh, this area a new um, fishing place. There were about 12 marinas that were successful at the same time in the in the early 50s uh, that were, you know, is a big fishing capital now. And um, and then in 1930s, uh, Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge actually was born. Um, and uh, today we know it as a Sunny Bono Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge. But uh, back then it was just the, uh, you know, the one of the first wildlife refuges out there. Uh, the All-American Canal uh, started getting dug again. Uh, this is, we, we were using the Imperial Canal, right, in 1901 when I mentioned it. Now you're in 1930s, they're building this All-American Canal from the Colorado River, uh, bringing water into um, Imperial Valley. Then they line the canal and save about 67,000 acre feet of water if, in 2010. Uh, so, so things are you know, improving a little bit. Water management is getting a little bit better. In 48, we had a 122-mile Coachella Canal uh, being fed by the All-American Canal and the Colorado River, and that would uh, feed now the Palm Springs, Coachella Valley, Indio, all those places up north of the Salton Sea. Okay, so we got a little bit of history. Now, there's a little blip in history here that happened, um, a military blip that happened here at the Salton Sea that I have to mention because it has a little bit of long-term effects on what's happening at the Salton Sea today. So um, the Navy came in and, and developed Salton Sea Test Base. Uh, it was a time of World War II. They were testing atomic bomb shapes. OK, the dynamics of how are these bombs dropping? What will they do when they drop? That kind of stuff. Right. And they're full of uh, depleted uranium at the time. And so um, they put out test sites in the sea. So they've got these big square, you know, 20 foot by 20 foot uh, test sites out there and they're bombing those thousands of times. They're th dropping thousands of these bomb shapes and with depleted uranium in it. Okay, they accidentally bomb the town of Calpatria, the town of Nyland, two little towns that are still um, today out there that you can visit. But the big kicker is, which really gets my goat, is they dropped a bomb that was full of uranium, not depleted uranium, but uh, an atomic bomb, 12, times the size of the one that was dropped on Hiroshima. It did not have a detonator on it, so it did not go off, but it's still sitting at the bottom of the Salton Sea, along with all those pesticides, not pesticides, but all that depleted uranium, barium, whatever else that they found they ha had in those bombs. Along with that story, I'll just add that there were 27 planes that went down into the Salton Sea when they were testing. And they've only recovered half of those, uh, those um, pilots. I think that's kind of sad. But also on, on another note, too, they came out, the Navy came out in 96 to try to clean up the mess. They cleaned up one test site, some 8,000 uh, acres of, of waste, and it was so costly 
that they said, forget it. They just scrapped the whole idea of cleaning up the, any of the waste sites of the Salton Sea. So all that stuff is still at the bottom of the Salton Sea. And you'll know why I say this in a little bit, because I'm going to um, tell you what's currently happening out there. Here's the water line in, in 2014, 2018. You can kind of see the difference. The Salton Sea is actually shrinking. This is causing a problem in many ways. And we'll talk about that. That's, that is uh, more current. You can hardly get out to the Salton Sea, but this is the old Sandia test uh, site, the where they had all their um, their equipment. Now, 50s, nobody's paying attention to the 40s anymore. World War II's over. 50s, now everybody wants to, you know, party and have fun. So this is actually an early picture of the Salton Sea Recreation Area before it had campgrounds and things like that in it. Um, they started developing lots and uh, big tracts of homes out there. They started developing those. This happens to be the North Shore Beach uh, Yacht Club area. Remember that because I'm going to mention that a little bit later. They, they uh, you know, mentioned it in LA Times. They, uh, it's the glamour capital of the Salton Sea now. 20,000 interested parties made put deposits down on lots out in and around the Salton Sea. And then a mere, you know, 10 years later, there was only like 200 homes built. But there were homes like this along the Keys. There's different Keys areas at the Salton Sea. And this just happens to be one that is right now fighting for its life out there. Um, and I'll show you pictures of what it looks like here in a minute. This is Salton City, which... Uh, yeah, there are no homes. There are some homes out there. It's just uh, pretty much a ghost town out there. You know, welcome to Salton City. We, you know, build your house there. These are some of the postcards we, we, we'd see going around. Um, the Salton City 500, the boat races were out there um, because of the buoyancy, and the salt, the salinity in the sea. Remember, it's coming from the Colorado River water, and the Colorado River is one of the saltiest or the saltiest in the United States, river in the United States. So, of course, we're going to have salty sea out there, right? So here's another little example of who would frequent the area. Uh, the upper right corner, you'll see Guy Lombardo, who was a band leader back in the day. Um, Jerry Lewis, Frank Sinatra. And uh, if you look at the bottom picture, we got Rock Hudson on water skiing. So we, we, they thought it was going to be the next Palm Springs. They really did. But that was not to be that did not happen like they they planned it. So this is one of the prominent signs that are along Highway 86 that travels up and down the west side of the Salton Sea. In 1980, um, the Salton Sea was 35 parts per thousand in salinity. Um, the, every part is a 0.1 salinity and 35 parts per thousand is equal to the Pacific Ocean. So, um, so anyway, this sign had went over COVID. Uh, this, see, this was taken probably in 2018, this sign, this, this image. It was 4,980. During COVID, it was 2,980 for a, a lot. And now, just a couple of months ago, I, was, I drove by there and it was 9,980. So I don't know if the housing boom is going to bring it down anymore or not. But anyway, so uh, 1940. Uh, reports from fish and wildlife, uh, you know, 40 parts per thousand. So salinity is going up pretty rapidly. Uh, I think I mentioned the Pacific Ocean was 35. Then finally, in uh, just in the late 80s, the state of California put out an advisory, don't eat the fish out of the Salton Sea. So... And in 1992, we had 150,000 eared grebes die off because of um, avian botulism and the, the salinity uh, stealing um, oxygen from the, from the sea. Then in 1994, 20 more thousand birds died, e eared grebes big die-offs, big stink, stinky die-offs. Um, and, and I was out there during that time photographing some of this stuff. These are, a lot of these pictures are taken from the um, uh, University of Redlands, who I work with to put together this pre presentation. But it wasn't until 1996 that 
w- once you get an endangered species, that brown pelican to you lose a, a thousand of them. So 15 to 20 percent of the population out there, they found about a thousand dead endangered species, brown pelicans. And um, that really brought attention to the Salton Sea. And people were thinking they have to do more and they have to do more faster. So Sonny Bono comes into the picture. He, uh, him and Babbitt, uh, Bruce Babbitt, uh, you know, discuss what we can do. The Salton Sea Task Force is, is uh, formed. And um, so a lot of uh, entities started looking at what they can do to uh, help the Salton Sea survive. And then 1999, whammo, we get this 7.6 million fish die off of the tilapia, uh, 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 carvina, and probably some more kinds of fish out there. And that probably hit the news as as big as the die off of the endangered species did. And uh, this is what people, when they refer to, oh, it's that stinky salt and sea out there. It's always stinking. Well, it's not always stinking. It's really not stinking right now. But in 1999, it was horrendous. You could not hardly, hardly hold your breath. You had to wear a mask. It seemed like it was just really, really bad because the, the fish died everywhere. There was just no no, um, no place unturned with dead fish. Every shore had them. So zooming forward quite a bit, I'm going to say the nail in the coffin for the Salton Sea, in my opinion, and my research is when um, it, it, it actually happened in 2018. But in back in 2003, when everybody thought we had plenty of Colorado River water, they came up with a quantitative settlement agreement between um, the seven states that own the Colorado River water, Nevada, Arizona, California, um, um, you know, all those river, um, Colorado, and a couple more. Anyway, off the top of my head, I'm trying to go fast. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, so they agreed to give Imperial Valley, Imperial Irrigation District agreed to give San Diego 40% of their water allotment. And what happened January 1st, 2018? Water came to San Diego. And now we get, that's a huge chunk of water. San Diego had the biggest building boom I've seen ever in my life, I think. And they're still building there because they got all this water. So Nail in the coffin. That's what I call it. Okay, so we're going to set that aside for a minute. We're going to talk about the economic drivers in the Imperial Valley because there's more to the story than what I just told you. Geothermal. There are 11 geothermal, successful geothermal plants in Imperial Valley. Ten of them are owned by Warren Buffett's uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And... uh, And the process of geothermal is extracting uh, boiling water out of the ground, using it to generate electricity, and then pumping it back into the ground. It's probably one of the cleanest ways to generate electricity still today, maybe. I don't know. They're coming up with all sorts of stuff. But anyway, um, so these seven plants are out there, and um, you can see... um, why they might have chosen this area. I mentioned earlier that uh, Bombay Beach and the uh, San Andreas Fault came right through, um, down through the Salton Sea in that area, just kind of east of it. Uh, So in the Mecca Hills. But this is the kind of thing you see out there. These are um, mud volcanoes from boiling water that's coming up from the ground. So why wouldn't you put a geothermal plant there and pull that, extract that that hot water, generate your electricity, and then pump it back in the ground? This is happening all over out there. This These ge- geothermal um, mud volcanoes are in different spots in the area. One of them is so big that they're having to move railroad tracks and Highway 111 that's on the east side of the Salton Sea so that it doesn't get engulfed um, with, you know, or break down in a big hole in the in the um, in the middle of the road. Right. So anyhow, it's very interesting. So these are the geothermal plants out there. And I put in a couple of pictures because I think they're kind of fun to photograph. Um, And this, by the way, is all conservation photography. If anybody needs these pictures to tell a story, um, just email me or, you know, if you know of somebody, if, uh, you know, that needs these kind of images, just let me know. But anyway, so these are the some of the plants out there and 
And uh, the newest thing, though, I'll say before I go on to the next slide is lithium. And you've probably heard that, um, you know, we're getting lithium from different parts of the world. But actually, they have found uh, lithium in, in near the Salton Sea. So there is a brand new, there's an Australian company that's out there right now digging, um, uh, putting in a geothermal plant at the same time, they're going to extract lithium, which we need for all of our car batteries to go electric and all this kind of stuff, right? So this is, this could be a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know how it's going to end up for the Salton Sea. Um, it could really wreak havoc with the, in, you know, the nature's internal system, or it could be really good as, um, as far as money coming into the area that will help build the infrastructure around the Salton Sea. So that's that one thing. The other economic driver is agribusiness. Um, this upsets me a little bit because we have um, uh, farmland that's uh, under Let's see, I, I think I've got the numbers here. 40, 444,000 acres still under um, uh, cultivation for alfalfa. So alfalfa to feed our cows, our horses, our whoever, right? It gets alfalfa. It's in 2018, and I have not pulled uh, new numbers since before the pandemic. Uh, it was a $4.5 billion business. And we don't reap the benefits of this um, this alfalfa, this alfalfa goes uh, overseas, China, Russia, all sorts of places. It, this alfalfa does not, not all of it stays in the United States. And so here's the big problem that people are saying right now, if you read the news, it's, um, it's our water, it's our Colorado River water that are irrigating these farms of alfalfa and we're reaping the we're, we're taking those benefits and shipping them overseas when we really need the water here in you know southern california you know colorado nevada everywhere right in southern in uh, uh the southwest so so that's just something to think about i don't know what they're going to do about that i do know that there are some uh things happening uh out in the salton sea as far as fallowing fields but i don't know how how the alfalfa is affected not only is there alfalfa there is lettuce it's the number one crop out there um we've got grapes we've got onions we've got dates uh al aloe vera um carrots and bell peppers and you know if you go out there at the right time of year even if you're not at the right right time of year there's always something to photograph out there like for instance in august uh the date farms get um pollinated there's actually a, a a pollination process that is hand done to pollinate the those medjool dates that are out there growing it it's out of this world people are up on ladders you know, impregnating these dates. It's crazy. Um, but anyway, so these farm workers, these migrant workers are out there busting their butt um, and, you know, getting paid for the buckets they bring back. This lady punches their tickets. So there's great stories. There's great conservation stories out there anywhere you go, any time of year. But I do have to tell you, it's really hot in the summer. So you may not want us. Well, there's one reason to go out in the summer that's really good. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, 2017 livestock report, cattle was the number one commodity, grossed over 387 million. Now they're bringing in uh, lambs, sheep, uh, grazing. So you say, what about the birds? Finally, are we going to talk about the birds? Well, we are sort of. <laughs> so I'm just going to bring up a bird, this pretty picture so we can all see that there are pretty pictures that can be made out there. Um, unfortunately, we still have some avian botulism uh, uh, outbreaks at the sea. And um, so there are some dead birds you'll find on the shoreline. The waters receded quite a bit. So you see the barnacles that the Navy brought in with their ships and all that kind of stuff that they had there in during World War II. Um, it's 61 parts per thousand today. So that's almost double what the Pacific Ocean is. And so it's kind of a sad, in a sad state of affairs. We used to see cormorants, um, uh, you know, um, uh, pelicans, brown pelicans in mass out there, uh, um, egrets and night herons and caspin terns and all those perciferous birds, right? The birds that eat fish. They're a little bit harder to come by, but they're still out there. There's still places you can see them. Um, 
But most of the time, what we see is the water boatman and the pile worm. And they're the two of the ugliest little things. But I'm telling you, that water boatman is saving some of the salt and sea um, uh, bird habitat. And uh, there are so many birds out there now uh, that are sh- uh, um, uh, water birds. Uh, we've got avocets and, you know, uh, long neck stilts, black neck stilts, uh, you know, uh, sandpipers and killdares and I, w- ibis and everything, all sorts of things out there that are really making use of the um, the new food source, which is the water boatman and the pile worm out there. So it, things are changing at the sea. I don't think it'll ever be full of fish and we'll see all those great, you know, blue herons and all that kind of stuff again. But there is still stuff out there that you can photograph. And one of the big things is the the burrowing owls. So if you ever, I mean, they're all over the place now. Burrowing owls are get, coming and making a comeback. But about 70% of California's population of burrowing owls call the Imperial Valley their home. And, um, and with this home, they've got lots of friends and advocates. So they are um, digging burrowing owl um, uh, burrows and putting in artificial uh, piping. They're marking burrowing owl nesting out there. Um, here's another example. Uh, somebody, a couple of months ago when I was out there, somebody had kicked this all over. So I have no idea how, how good this little burrowing owl nest is doing anymore. But um, but you can see them along the, the farm farming channels, uh, you know, those, those irrigation ditches that are bringing water into the farmers. They're all over through those uh, channels. So you can see a burrowing owls quite a bit out there. Um, and any farmer that has to upgrade their channel has to, in, uh, has to um, check with the ir- irrigation district and get permission uh, and they'll either remove the owl and relocate it or, or not give permission for that farmer to um, upgrade his um, his uh, um, ch- can't channel that's bringing water in. Uh, OK, so there's the state, California state threatened uh, sandhill cranes, which are, you know, pretty far south. Right. Imperial Valley is about as far south until you get into Mexico. And the cranes do go into Mexico, too. But we do have a small population. Uh, again, mid-December to mid-January is the best time to see sandhill cranes out there in the area and photograph. Um, we have um, uh, logger-headed shrike. They're, um, they're, they're not migratory. They're out there seen all year round. Are the eared grebes are loving those water boatmen, so they are gaining in um, numbers. I mean, to the tunes of you know, hundreds of thousands of of eared grebes out there. Ruddy ducks are back. We've got a nice population of ruddy ducks going. Um, uh, there's always gulls, and there's always different kinds of gulls out there. But when there is a die off, they've got these uh, water boats that'll go out and pick up the all these dead fish and um, or the dead birds. And we have. Um, Lots of area, even in the Salton Sea itself, uh, remember it's tw- 61 parts per thousand, just perfect for pupfish. So so there's going to be a, a different species of fish out there. You know, things change. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. The water is warming up because it's getting less and, and we've got the salinity up and up and you know, this is kind of a, a normal scene out there, a geothermal plant in the background, and we've got irrigation watering. So this is just a flood irrigation. But now they're saying um, that uh, the salinity is rising one part per thousand annually. We get about three inches of rain out there if we're lucky. Um, and the temps are in the hundreds uh, during the summer, over 100, right? Uh, we just had a 110 out there a couple of weeks ago. So now they're going to this, uh, another way to irrigate. This is an old way. I It makes no sense to me, but this is what they're doing out there. So you're going to see a lot of this irrigation equipment out and around the Salton Sea, which is interesting. So trends of the Salton Sea. Um, like I said, we're losing the perciferous birds. Um, uh, uh, but the pelicans actually are finding other places to um 
to settle in and look for fish. Uh, there are a couple of, um, there's um, Alamo wetlands, there's New River wetlands, and there's a couple of other ponds and waterways that they're filtering water from the Alamo River and the New River and trying to clean it up. And these birds are finding these places. And so am I. Every time I'm out there, I'm finding a new place where I find all these birds. So, um, you know, and right here, this is actually unit one of the Sunny Bono Salt and Sea uh, National Wild life refuge and we've got northern shovelers we've got um yellow lakes we've got all sorts of birds out there um uh, uh dow witchers um more gulls uh uh snow geese snow geese at the same time of year the the um sandhill cranes will be down there mid uh, uh december through mid january i mean that's the best two weeks or four weeks to see them uh you know pretty much it historically that's been the best um and of course there's a, little, a few more sand uh snow geese to show you and those are in the ponds uh where they're building that new four thousand acres of wetlands out there so the photography is possible there are lots of fun things to do out there this is one of the water used to come way up beyond this. You can see these are nests. These are old cormorant nests. And we used to go out and photograph them with the out here, you know, when we had water there with reflections and like one of the images I showed you back in the 1930s. So, I mean, I wasn't around for that, but um, <laughs> that's what it looked like then. So another critical issue today that adds to the problem out there is the playa, it keeps growing. So uh, the playa is the um, the part of that's being exposed as the lake, as the Salton Sea shrinks. And it's projected to be 74,000 acres by 2047. And actually they're saying that this is going to be a dead sea, just like the aerial sea and a few other dead seas that you may have heard of, uh, you know, in, in history. Um, they say that it's going to be right around the time that this turns into a dead sea at the going rate of what's happening out there. So, Asthma rates are twice the national average. This is just one example of the blowing dust and an asthma patient. Um, I, I went to the West Shore School one day to try to get permission to photograph in the um, nurse's office because I heard there are lockers full of um, inhalers and kids have to come in two, three, four or five times a day just to um, use their inhaler. Uh, but those are all locked up. They would not give me permission. So I'm not sharing that with you tonight. Um, I'll keep trying to get permission on that one though. So this is one of those keys I showed you earlier where the water, um, you know, people could take their boats and, you know, go out into the sea and come back and they had beautiful docks. And this was taken about four years ago. And today they're almost bone dry, but there's a, um, push and um, I don't know where they're at with this in in uh, legislation, but they're actually going to be pumping water back into these keys at desert shores only. It's the only area that the community and the people that live there are fighting like tooth and nail to try to get their keys back. This doesn't make a lot of sense to me because that water is going to continue to drop down. Although this is the deeper part of the Salton Sea, the northern part of the Salton Sea. So maybe it'll be successful. We'll see. But that's kind of what it looked like four years ago. And now the water is just gone. You can see the, the image on the top left. Um, but there are stories to be told in each and every one of these images. And they, they make for a great um, conservation story if you're entering these some of these contests out there, um, you know, they'll accept images like this. So, um, you know, trash, graffiti, you know, unkept uh, um, channels. This is where the old Salton Sea um, uh, uh, Yacht Club used to sit. And I remember going out there and seeing the neon sign and all this. This happened in the last 40 years. It's completely gone. People have just raped what was there and no water. So we have dry, this is what we have. I mean, this is, you can photograph cracked mud all the time. So what are they trying to do to improve it? So at Red Hill Bay Marina, they started a project. It's said estimated construction 2016. They never got this started until last year. So they're doing things. Um, another uh, 
um, the, the band of Torres Martinez Indians put in an 85 acre wetland. Okay. But I just told you 74,000 acres are going to be of playa are going to be, um, lifting off in the deserts, you know, and wind blowing to Arizona, you know, as far as Arizona and stuff. So 85 acres, nice start. So I'm hoping to see more of these wetlands come up. Uh, I believe that's the only thing that's going to save the surrounding the sea. Um, they do a thing called surface roughening. You see in number picture number four there on the left. Uh, then they plant iodine bush uh, to try to mitigate all those blowing dust there. This is the silliest picture I've ever picked up. Um, this guy's lining one of these little, like, canals i have no idea i have no idea look at the distance away from the sea they are makes no sense to me but anyhow these are all all kinds of um possible solutions they think um uh california has uh close to a billion dollars uh to put towards the solution of the salt and sea but they keep dwindling it down for um uh, doing tests and research and all that kind of stuff. And I have to say that um, uh, back in 2018, the estimates were eight to 12 billion to restore it. Now it's, they're saying closer to 20 billion. And to compare that, the Everglades took 15 billion to restore, Mississippi River, 14 billion, and Mono Lake there in, in uh, you know, Northeastern California, uh, 1.2 billion. So I do not know what it's going to take we don't have all the money that it's going to, you know, maybe it's lithium that's going to bring in the dollars that really um, helps the communities. I don't know. I'm more worried about the birds. So that's my goal, like conservationist bird habitat. We need to save that. But on a lighter note, this is part of the San Andreas Fault. You can actually walk to it. It's not very far off the road. Um, and it's a it's a damper, wetter place and the, and the, the um, the wildflowers just go crazy out there in the spring. So it's kind of a fun thing to do out there. It's in the, it's just outside of the city of Mecca. Uh, and, you know, if you want to email me with a, um, a question on how to get there, I can, I can certainly share that with you later. Um, that's quail bush. There's, um, there's fun things to do out there and things to photograph. This is the date Oasis Gardens. You can sample about, I don't know, 12 or 14 different kinds of dates that they grow out there. Delicious. You can, um, you can buy dates. You can watch the video they run out there that tells you the history of dates. And you can order your peanut butter or your chocolate uh, uh, date, date shake. Um, they've got like a whole slew of different, um, if that sounds good to you. It doesn't sound good to me. I'll just have a date shake, please. There's a banana museum out there and not a, not a favorite of mine, but might be fun if you, if you're into bananas <laughs> um, there, here is what I talked about earlier, the North shore yacht club. They've actually redone the yacht club and spent um, a couple hundred million, not a couple hundred, a couple million dollars to redo the yacht club. It doesn't look like it did in the fifties, but it, it is very, it's a community center now. And, um, and then we, you can go out there and, and walk around it. You can see those two people way out on that sandbar and you can, uh, there's birds out there. Early mornings are really good to get out there and, and do some birding. This is just another little example from out there. This is a 14,000 acre um, <clears throat> wetlands area that is um, part of a, um, a, a big project just west of the um of the san andreas fault and this is kind of a fun place uh to go visit uh this is the salt creek um area and a photograph there uh there's also um pupfish in the area uh the uh salt and sea um visitor center which is at the salt and sea recreation area has a um bird festival every year go out there. It's in January and um, just get on their website and check when the next one is. But that was one of the sightings. Those are some of the sightings we had out there uh, back in 2019. Bombay Beach, I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about the San Andreas Fault. That's kind of the terminus of the San Andreas Fault. And it's just a community that is rich in um, eclectic art. 
they have a, um, an annual uh, group of artists that come in and do song and dance and music. And, um, and then they put up um, different artworks in the area. This is one of the billboards that has lasted in the area for a long time. This is probably mainly what you'll see there as far as the estates, but a lot of people are coming in buying up small lots there and putting out, um, you know, upgrading their homes in that area. Uh, this is one of the, um, the Bombay Beach Drive-In was one of the um, uh, installations, the art installations that you can find there. But you, you can walk through all these little places and find great things to photograph. Um, the Ski Inn is famous for being the lowest bar in the Western hemisphere. And so, um, and I have, I might say the coldest beer that you'll find in that area. So um, stop it and see there. This is out at Red Hill Marina. You'll see a little less water than when these were taken a couple of years ago. Um, here are some of the mud pots you can still visit. Uh, and when there is water, it's tough to get out with a two wheel drive car. You almost need four wheel drive area um, because it's really soft mud to get out there. But anyhow, you can get uh, photographs and uh, tell stories with images like this. Uh, the Southern Pacific still runs a line from LA into Mexico. Uh, they take LA trinkets down to Mexico and they bring Ikea furniture back into the United States. Uh, they're one of their biggest things. This is, um, Salvation Mountain, where a um, kind of an uh, a kind of a folk lore guy founded this this uh, dirt pile and then got free paint from everywhere. And if you look it up, it's on the National Historic Record of uh, Folk Art sites now. He has since Leonard Knight was his name. He's since passed away, but you can still visit this area and. Um, um, and it's kind of a fun little place to visit. That was Leonard when he when I last saw him. But he will take any kind of paint or the the uh, the people that are running the nonprofit there now. It's a nonprofit uh, will accept any paint, whether it has lead in it or not. They just uh, and they just make all sorts of updates and upgrades to their area. This was taken at a place called East Jesus, and it's another area of uh, art installations that you can uh, visit and photograph at. Um, and the, these people actually formed, formed a 5013C, and they owned the property that they're on. Whereas if you look back at the, uh, at the Salvation Mountain, and there's a place called Slab City out there where a lot of people live for free. There's no infrastructure. There's no cops. There's no water. There's no nothing. They just bring their RVs out there and they live out there. So this is at the end of that road. These people do have a composting toilet. Um, some of the, you know, finer amenities of, <laughs> of living in the desert. Uh, here's a couple more pictures of um, who you might find out there. So, and you can find birds. So, you know, it's all about the birds in the Salton Sea. Uh, here you have um, uh, bird art that I photographed. Um, most of the land around the Salton Sea is owned by the Imperial Irrig Irrigation District, and there's no trespassing, but that doesn't stop anybody. Uh, they trespass anyway. It's just another little sunset shot, another late night evening shot of the geothermal plants across from Salton City, which is on the west side. All the geothermal plants are on the east side of the Salton Sea. They do have a, a, par, a parasailing um, competition, if you call it that, but it's kind of fun. It's in the month of February. And this was uh, the last time I had a complete list because I had somebody with me helping me with the list in 2018. The, I would say that 90% of everything on this list is still out there. So in one morning, I saw 67 species of birds out there. So it's not impossible. It's just a little, or maybe a little bit more challenging to find some of these birds out there. Um, like I said, it's uh, managed for hunters. So just watch for hunters. Uh, hunting season is uh, December, January, uh, or well, actually October, November, December, and then the youth gets to get to hunt in January. Uh, so, but they keep um, the hunters away from the roads. So I don't think there's, I've never been threatened by a hunter or um, had any kind of, um, uh, you know, projectile come my way. I've never had any problem out there. And I'm out there always in January, always in December. 
uh, sometimes in February. So I, I really just don't have that much uh, trouble with anybody out there. And here we go. I'm just going to run through a couple of pictures because we're almost at the end of some of the wildlife that we can see out there. Green herons, uh, snow geese, um, you know, uh, Phoebes and, um, you know, egrets and white crown sparrows and metal larks and just all sorts of stuff. Kestrels galore. Um, usually earlier than the snow geese get there. I kind of see kestrels more in the spring. Um, uh, red tail hawks, a lot of them out there. Uh, kites, uh, quail, and, you know, turkey vultures everywhere out there. So I just want to say these are some of the I have appreciation for these people that helped me develop this story, this conservation story. And, you know, some of them uh, donated images and they were all credited for those. Um, the last one on the list is my husband, Bruce. He's my dog sitter and my just my overall support team. He lets me go out there and spend a week or two out there just running around looking for birds. And and then if you need any of the references that I used for um, some of the stories I told in this um, this program, there is, um, there's a bunch of them. So you can go to those places. And like, if you need this page or you want me to send you more information, just go to my website and email me. Um, and that is, is it. You can find me at investinnature.org. Call me or send me an email. And I'm going to quit sharing my screen. So there you go. Back to you, Linda. Thanks, Sandy. So um, there, I didn't see any questions, but I did. And I'm going to share the chat um, uh, line. I don't know what we call it, the chat with you, because there were a lot of um, nice comments in there, specifically about how bad, bad we are as humans. We, we destroy this. We, we are, we are, we're the problem, but um, it was really, really informative. And um, you had me at Kestrels. I'd go out there just for the Kestrels. Yeah. The Kestrels are all over the wires. They're, they're a little skittish, but, um, yeah. but there's so often you can find a, a good Kestrel at eye level. I shoot for my car a lot as a blind out there. It's very easy to do. The birds are, especially the burrowing owls, they're very acclimated oh. um, and not very, uh, they might be skittish, but you just kind of wait. You got to give them time. Be patient. Yeah. Um, I, there was a comment early on from uh, Vernon who said he, he water skied out there in the fifties and he was absolutely shocked at how different it looks now. So yeah. that that's, that's kind of heartbreaking. There was a note that just flew by me here. A uh, question. Susan's curious. Do you have anything more to say about the unexploded bombs? No, I don't. And I don't really know how to dig into that. I'm not a journalist. And I sure would like to find out the more of the story. But I do know that they're there. And um, I went to a program uh, from an ex-military who did all that research. And he did not have very much updated information either. He said it's very, although it's some of it's declassified, some of it, um, it not all of it is. Okay, that's that would be really interesting if you mm -hmm. got that information. Yeah. All right, with that, Sandy, I'm going to thank you for coming and talking to a room full of strangers and sharing, you know, something that you are very well versed in about an area of, of the United States that I, I had, like I said, I had to look it up. Um, mm -hmm. so I feel like I've got a little bit of flavor and and it and the variety of birds that are using that um as their habitat mm -hmm. it really is kind of worth a road trip out there to, for birding just to, to see what you can find and so yeah. with that thank you for coming and and thank yeah. you for sharing what you know well so, thanks for having me yeah you guys can connect with sandy through her website investinnature.org and if you're on instagram check her out at slz photo next week street videographer and content creator joshua thomas gray joins us with his presentation building empathy through art so until next time go out and create something beautiful and i hope that we'll see you again soon mm -hmm.